Well, hey, Eric. Hey, I appreciate you, you spending a, a few minutes of your busy day. Um, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you're from? Absolutely, Corey. Glad to be here. Thanks so much for taking some time and, and chatting with me today. Um, I'm Eric Bates. I'm a lifelong hotelier, um, general manager currently for the last uh, two and a half years of Wing Spread Retreat and Executive Conference Center up in beautiful Racine, Wisconsin, right on the Lake Michigan shore. Um, have a background in luxury full service hotels, resorts and conference centers. And, uh, you know, found my, you know, ideal home out here uh, planning uh, conferences for Wing Spread. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, um, we, uh, we have a topic that came up and it's, uh, it's revolves around the subject of architecture of meetings. Um, thought it very intriguing, very fascinating. Couldn't think of a, a better person to help shine some light, light on that and describe a little bit more about what that is. Could you share a, a little bit about what that is and yeah. how it's relevant yeah. to meetings? Yeah, actually, it, it's a it's a, a concept that's really I think more more people uh, more planners uh, kind of think of, of planning a meeting as just kind of finding a space, putting a bunch of people in it, and then delivering an agenda. Mm. But for us, and for a lot of uh, meeting venues that are really concerned about the outcome and about really crafting an experience that's really important to the participants, we call it more of an architecture of meetings, um, and and that that entails lots of little components. So it's not just uh, finding a date and putting people in a room. It's really uh, making something important out of the meeting. It's something important uh, needs to happen during the meeting. Not every planner knows how to do that. So uh, planners like the one we have here at Wingspread have a toolbox, really a virtual toolbox of resources and um, meeting um, ideas uh, that will help a planner get the the goal of the meeting across. Um, sometimes when we work with planners, they don't even know what they need. Um, and, and we're there to kind of help them or guide them. And sometimes even when we look at their agenda, we can see an opportunity for maybe a little bit deeper growth or a little bit better message delivery, uh, some nuance that we might be able to change that would make their meeting even more effective. Um, you know, I think to uh, Henry Ford once said, um, trying to think if I get this right, if he would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that, that's one of those things where you're like, you know, it's, it's kind of like you, you're in your own box and you think this is what I need to deliver my meeting. But when someone else looks at it, they go, no, I think you need something more. And that's what a, a really talented meeting planner can deliver is help to push your agenda a little bit further along to where you maybe didn't even know you needed it. Well, and then that leads me to my next question. Why, why is that important anyway? So I thought we would just get together, get a space, like you said, find a venue, Great food and beverage, right? Can we just all gather and have a great time? Why Why do we need architecture? Yeah, I'll tell you why. So it, uh, simply to, to deliver your message, you don't need architecture. But to deliver something that's impactful, something that's going to resonate, something that's going to last, or maybe the point of your meeting is to get everybody rejuvenated and recharged and uh, you know set for personal or professional growth. That kind of cre needs a, 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 a an environment created around it. So let me give you a couple of examples of things that we would consider components of an architecture that we would build around a meeting. So the first thing is a point of contact, a single one. So our meeting planner here works with our contacts and a lot of uh, other um, conference centers have a similar setup where you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone at the facility. That's really important when it comes to changes, modifications, dietary restrictions, all of those sorts of things can get lost in, this, in the mix if you're communicating with more than one person. Mm -hmm. A dedicated conference attendant really gets to know you, gets to know your program, and any changes, they're right there to help you execute on. Uh, I think the other thing that we really like to hear, and most planners maybe don't want to, you know, get into the nitty gritty of what their agenda contains or what the purpose of their meeting is, but we do. Um, here, we think it's important that we help you achieve the goal of your meeting. We're not here just to give you a meeting space and chairs. Uh, we're really here to help you deliver that goal. Um, and we, so we really need to know what your agenda and your purpose is and let us help you kind of craft a meeting around that. I think one of the things people miss too is there's, there needs to be a plan for what's going to happen after your meeting. And so we talk about that with meeting planners. How are you planning to disseminate the information that you learned or the um, sort of the solutions that you might have either gathered or started heading down the road towards, right? How do you do, disseminate that information back to the attendees? When the meeting's over and people go back to their offices, a lot of times meetings get forgotten about. 
How do we make sure that your meeting doesn't get forgotten about? And I think that's part of the architecture too, the whole planning, the back end. Um, and you know, we, we like to make sure that they're, the meetings are thoughtful, they're productive, because when those type of meetings are tend to have, tend to have a better impact, they tend to stick with people. Um, and then when we know those things, we can uniformly exceed participants' expectations. And so when they leave here, they've had a great meeting. The client has gotten a great value out of their meeting. They've spent some money, but they've gotten a really great result out of it and they've really engaged their team. Those are all really important components of, of crafting a really great meeting. Um, but there are others um, and it comes down to the participants as well. Who you're inviting, um, what groups of people you're inviting. Are you inviting a bunch of people that all think the same way? I mean, that's that's huh. kind of one of the big mistakes, right? That people- that echo chamber. Right, an echo chamber. Nobody needs a, a room full of yes people. Uh, really, the divergent perspective is, is what really makes change happen. You really want to hear from everybody. And, and I think part of our crafting of these meetings is really respect for the diverse perspectives that everybody brings. And that could be the extrovert that talks a lot in the meeting and the introvert that never says anything. How do we get those ideas out? Because everybody's got an idea to share, especially if you crafted the right attendee list mm. so that the right people are in the room. Um, and then, you know, aside from, from all of the meeting components like that, there's the environmental components. You know, is your room a, a, a big square room with wallpaper and beige walls and beige carpets and fluorescent lighting? Or is it a big, beautiful room that's purpose, purposely built for meetings? It's not a gymnasium one day or a banquet hall the other day. It's a, it's a meeting room, right? That's built for meetings. Um, nat, plenty of natural light, hard writing surfaces, anti-glare surfaces, comfortable heating and air conditioning controls. Um, all of those sorts of things help to keep the attendee comfortable. The seating environment, what does the chair feel like? What does that room feel like? The natural views, the, the ample lighting, all of that's really, really important. The natural lighting, um, you know, speaking of us here at Wingspread, every meeting room we have has a beautiful view out onto our acreage. So those things are important because it keeps people engaged. It keeps people calm. It keeps people um, sort of relaxed. Um, beyond that, there's the guest house. Where where are you going to house your attendees? Are they going to stay at the facility that you're 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 hosting your meeting at, or do you have to bus them? Do you have to transport them to another uh, lodging facility? Here at Wingspread, we built our conference center and our guest house specifically to house the folks that attend our meetings. And there's an important reason for that. Uh, when people tend to um, come from divergent perspectives and they're trying to build a relationship during the day, the last thing you want to do is take them to an opera, to a hotel somewhere else, right? They go their own ways. Some people go off and have dinner. They connect back with the people that they're comfortable with and they don't get to connect with the people that they might mm. have, have agreement with, right? Right. By keeping them here at Wingspread and keeping them at the guest house, they have an opportunity after the meeting to socialize, to connect, to learn from each other in different ways. Um, it can be as simple as, Hey, I like s'mores. You like s'mores? We've got a great <laughs> fit out back and everybody gathers around and you start talking about different things. Kids, pets, travels, all of these sorts of things. And it kind of brings people together in a different way so that maybe they open up to someone else's opinion or someone else's view and they can find some commonality. Um, on top of all of that, there's connections and, and every connection that you make is an opportunity for either personal growth, professional growth, business growth. And so the more opportunities we can create for people to connect with one another, the more opportunities they have in their own lives and in their own business. So that's part of the architecture of a meeting. Where do you give them space to connect? Where do you give them space that you're not constantly talking at them? Mm -hmm. uh, where they can just kind of, we call it white space. Mm -hmm. It's just unplanned time that they can take a bike ride, take a walk, gather in a small group, have some personal reflective time, um, those are things that we think are very important. Um, if you cram too much into someone's head, they leave and it all kind of spills out. You really want it to seep in and you want people to have that time to sort of absorb what you're delivering. Love that. That whole right. concept of white space really resonated with me. As a former graphic designer, white space is used a lot. In fact, um, you know, there's some very famous instances of Volkswagen using white space, small visual tons of area around the ad it was it was unheard of you know uh in in the culture of the client saying i paid for the ad i want you to fill the entire page where right. white space becomes very very valuable in letting um the important things really resonate in highlighting those things uh, when it's not crowded in a in, in a in a variety of just stuff so that's right it kind of lets the ideas breathe 
right? I mean, exactly. especially if you're trying to convey a new thought or a new process or a new whatever it is at this meeting, you really want to let it breathe. If you kind of pack it all in there and expect people just to suck it up, it doesn't happen. People have to reflect on it. They have to breathe. They have to have this kind of downtime. And that's what white space delivers. You're right. I love that. One of the really interesting things I had, I had read um, on your website was this whole convening model. Right. What, it, what is that? I've never seen that before. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is? Sure. So the convening model of uh, the Johnson Foundation at Wingspread, uh, that's the foundation based here at Wingspread, has been meeting in this historic Frank Lloyd Wright home since 1961. And mm -hmm. the tools that they use and the process by which they um, approach every meeting are some of the same tools we use on the conference center side here. The idea of incorporating different ideas, the idea, uh, the, the idea of bringing people together from divergent perspectives so they can connect with one another. Um, the 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 follow-up that they do um all of these things are very calculated it doesn't just a great meeting doesn't just happen what you have to do is give it the space to let it happen organically to let these meetings really kind of come to life and uh, you one of frank lloyd wright's um favorite words when it came to building design was organic he always liked to use the term organic and he mm. thinks of it as being very organic it's one with the earth one with the nature um, and that's sort of how meetings should happen. And meetings should be relatively organic. You should mm -hmm. have an agenda, sure. You should have topics and you should have a well thought out uh, plan for what to ha what happens after the meeting. But during the meeting, you really have to let these things kind of develop on their own and, and deliver the topic, deliver the content, let people talk about it, let people absorb it, let people connect around it. And that's some of these, con those con that convening model is all designed around getting to the outcome that you desire at the end of the day. Sometimes that isn't a solution. Sometimes that's just a step towards a solution. And oftentimes the work is to put people together to get them talking about the idea and then let them take that to the next step somewhere else. So I think if you push for a solution at the meeting, it doesn't always work. It, again, it's not organic and right. you're kind of forcing it. I, I totally get that. I, that makes complete sense. Speaking of outcomes. Yeah. You guys might be obviously are on to something because there have been some landmark outcomes that I've read uh, that have happened at Wingspread. But aside from of that, what are some just some, you know, some ballpark or expectations of outcomes that you could share with us? Sure. Yeah, I think whenever we go to a meeting, I, when our, I do, I'm sure you've gone to plenty of meetings, uh, right, where you leave the meeting going, could that have been an email? Should that have really gathered? Should all of us have flown across the country to meet for that purpose? Um, and I think uh, the outcomes that we look for are ones that that inspire people, that allow them to be reflective. They can be life-changing, some of the things that they do here. If you deliver the content well, you give them time to uh, absorb it, talk about it, communicate about it, collaborate on it. Um, you know, and the right people are in the room, then I think those meetings are well worthwhile and they and they can't happen over a conference call, right? Um, I think it, you know, like I said a, a minute ago, great meetings create opportunities. They, they, uh, they create opportunities to connect both from a business perspective and a personal perspective um, so that the meeting lives longer than just the time that they're here at Wingspread or in any conference facility, right? They go back with new connections and now they connect with those folks when they're back in their offices and the learning and the development and the growth continues. So I think that's the, the, the kind of outcome that any planner would want, right? You don't just want to throw a bunch of meeting, money at a meeting, have some great food and beverage, have some fun, but then at the end of the meeting, nothing really changes. Um, so that's, I think that's what we focus on. That's why we focus on the outcome as much as we do. Ah, that's wonderful. I love that. Um, in fact, I've, I've had many conversations the last couple of weeks um, re re regarding this whole remote work culture and having key figureheads focus on outcomes versus marking off task lists, right? I right. need to do X, Y, regardless of if that's transitioning into a, a desired result of some sort. And I think that, that's that really, really... Uh, resonated with me. So, well, and look here, we 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 are all too distracted and overscheduled uh, these days. It, it, technology uh, has made it possible for us to do more with less from anywhere, right? But that sometimes leaves us with less life. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, the the time that we do dedicate to any of these 
meetings or events or anything that we do is even more important, it seems, these days than it was in the past, where people are expecting you to either working remote, working in an office, working off your cell phone. I mean, it's just like it's work, 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 work. Right. And we always have to keep in mind that there is a balance we have to strike. Um, you know, when, when we're when we're asking attendees to come to a meeting, we want them to both have fun, learn, engage, have great food and then leave uh, and do something with what they learn. Absolutely. And um, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the enjoyment element, you know, I think uh, traditionally work and personal life, we've had a very distinct lot, line between that. But, but, you know, scientifically, we're finding out that people absorb, they're going to they're going to be more willing to try different things, open up during the meeting if they're enjoying it, if it's if it's something that they want to do. Right. You're not fighting against that re resistance. So luckily it sounds like uh, we're making some definitely some progress in that area yeah we we are we, you know whenever we can bring the walls down around someone's uh you know attendance in a meeting that that's what we want to do and that's when i was referring earlier to the introvert that might not speak yep. right or the person in your office that that says oh you know i'm gonna let bob talk because bob always talks but you know what that person has some great ideas so you've got to create an environment that makes it comfortable for them to want to open up exactly. and you want to kind of bring those ideas forward the best ideas come from people that maybe you didn't even expect totally right. oh god i can't that you definitely hit a high point with me on that absolutely um hey you've had some one we've had some great conversations some fantastic tips but i want to hear some eric Bates secret sauce what can you share with us well let's see i you know it's, I've spent a life in hospitality, right? And and I guess w when people ask, you know, why do I do it? What 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 keeps me going? Um, I think Nelson Mandela said something that always strike that always struck a chord with me, and it really resonated. Years ago, he said, you know, our world is divided by race, color, gender, religion. Um, nowadays, you can probably throw politics in there. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, but it's really it's divided into wise people and fools, right? And mm. fools divide themselves by race, color, gender, religion, oh, right? So it's like you know, I just I strive to be a difference maker. Everybody is a um, everybody's a mom or a dad or a son or a daughter or a aunt or an uncle or brother or sister. I try and make sure that I treat them with the respect that they deserve, with a friendly disposition. Um, I, I try and show find ways to show kindness. And that's what hospitality is all about. That's what it started out as, uh, you know, started out 15 years old in the hospitality business. And that's hmm. that's how it started. But long before I knew about revenue and making money and finding new sources of business and all the things that come along with the business end of it, um, it was really at the heart of it, being kind, finding a way to connect with people on a personal and individual level and appreciating every single person for what they bring to the world. That's my secret sauce, keeps I me happy. It. I love that. I love that. Especially in, like you had mentioned before in, in today's current climate where, you know, we've got emotions are running high. We've got division. I think we need, and quite honestly, I, I think some of it's by design, unfortunately. Um, I love the power of positivity and, and things that can bring us to bed. Cause there's not certainly not a quote I could ever state is that there's so many more things that, that bond us from the kind then, then divide us, right? Absolutely right, absolutely right. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I find in, in, you know, of course I meet people from all over the world, all different walks of life. And sometimes I just have to put a blinder on to a portion of them that I maybe I don't care about. Uh, you know, maybe there's a portion of their politics or their what, whatever it is that I don't, might not agree with. I have to put a blinder on that portion because that does not that does not make the whole person, right? The whole person is comprised of so many more other things. And I think, you know, these days we drive at that one little thing that maybe makes us different instead of looking at all the things that make us totally. similar. Absolutely. And so I think you just have to approach everyone like that. And everyone's entitled their opinions and, and uh, you know what, they have a right to live their lives. And, uh, you know, who's it, you know, it's it's not for me to, to, to decide who I'm going to like and who I'm not going to like. I'm just going to like everybody. There you go. I love that. Love that, Eric. And uh Great way to end this fantastic conversation. Hey, I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us and I can't wait for uh, us to do it again soon. Thank you. Yeah, it is great to be with you. Great, it's a beautiful day out here and, and uh, it's great to spend some time uh, away from the desk. Mm -hmm.